In my time researching armored vehicles, I've been able to talk to a lot of interesting and knowledgeable people. Books and documents are nice, but getting a first-hand account of how these things performed is even better. So, as you can imagine, I was pretty excited when I got an email from someone who worked on the ACVT program, the program that the HIMAG and HSTVL were a part of, with the latter being my all-time favorite vehicle. He worked as a contractor doing lethality analysis among other things, and apparently he stumbled across my video on it. We've been exchanging emails, and I was able to ask him a lot of questions about the HSTVL. Before we get into those though, he did ask me to do one thing. He didn't want me to focus too much on him as an individual. Instead, he wants the credit to go to the ACVT team as a whole. A lot of incredibly talented people worked on the program, and many of them have unfortunately passed away since then. In his own words, the project was definitely a team effort of which I was a part. I was just the one that happened upon your videos. Now without further ado, let's get on to the questions and answers. Could the gun fire all 26 rounds continuously? The HSTVL had a 6 round ready rack, and those rounds could all be fired at once if desired. The ready rack was continuously replenished from the stowed rounds. Please remember that the HSTVL was meant to be a very maneuverable and agile vehicle. The tactic that had the largest payoff in what we tested was to fire three round bursts at the target and then move to a new firing position. The move to a new position provided more than enough time to fully replenish the ready rack. If you were to fire all six rounds in one engagement, it took approximately five seconds to replenish the entire ready rack, which could easily be accomplished during the move to a new firing position. What was the final rate of fire for the XM274 cannon while it was mounted in the HSTVL? The 75mm medium caliber anti-armor automatic cannon, MCAAC, could fire one round every 0.8 seconds, with excellent ability to relay the gun into the target. Although the stated rate of fire was raised to one second as he noted in Jane's, because it was the unclassified rate at that time. How potent was XM885? The 75mm round could defeat armor up through the Soviet T-80 variants. As mentioned in your video, the plan was for the HSTVL to be upgunned to a 90mm MCAAC. Ballistics research labs at Aberdeen Proving Ground actually developed and fired the upgraded round. The major upgrade was replacing the tungsten carbide penetrator with one made of depleted uranium. I actually held the full-scale weighted mock-up of that round at one of our ACVT project meetings. The 90mm round would have defeated armor up through the Soviet T-90. A side note is that the 75mm round could defeat T-90 armor fired off axis. We analyzed research from all the major tank battles from World War II through the 1967 Israeli-Egyptian War, and we found that very few tanks ever fired other tanks front to front. Even 30 degrees off the front axis would give a tank a much better chance to defeat another tank. The agility and mobility of the HSTVL is meant to give it the capability of flank Soviet tanks, where the kill rate would be a lot higher. Approximately how fast was the HSTVL off-road? We modeled the HSTVL in two environments, Germany and Saudi Arabia slash Jordan, since those were the most likely places it would be deployed. In the Middle East scenario, top off-road speed was modeled at 50 miles an hour, based on testing of the running gear at the Waterways Experimentation Station, located in Vicksburg, Mississippi. In Germany, because of the terrain and forests, tested slash model off-road speed was 35 miles an hour. Because of the accelerations from off-road speeds like that, the crew were placed in semi-reclining positions. This allowed the crew to function without rattling around inside the vehicle. Their seats were also specially designed to damp most of the accelerations. Was the XM274 ever meant to degrade enemy armor? Our analysis pointed to a three-round burst being the most effective at defeating armor at distance. Not because of the lethality of the individual round, but because it increased the possibility of hitting the enemy tank. As the distance to an opposing tank increases, the probability that you will hit and kill the target with the first round decreases. This is especially true in a moving slash moving targeting scenario. In firing any type of weapon there are factors, anything from the manufacture of the individual round to variable wind speeds, that can cause rounds to deviate from the aim point. We test fired the 75mm MCAAC on the ranges at Fort Knox, and measured the dispersion of the rounds on the target. Those values were then analyzed in dispersion tables based on range were developed. Our analysis showed that the three round burst had the best chance of defeating an adversary tank at range, even if the first round killed it. Do you think it could have been a viable combat vehicle if it wasn't so expensive? I think that the HSTVL type vehicle would have been an incredible force multiplier. Our study showed a significant advantage with HSTVL type vehicles deployed. The cost of an HSTVL type vehicle is not as extreme as you may have read. There were officers on the Journal of the Army staff, as well as groups in the Pentagon, that favored the XM1 M1 development. Funding for an HSTVL type vehicle was diverted to the M1, to say the least. All of us on the ACVT program were very upset by that decision. Was the HSTVL made entirely of aluminum, or did it incorporate other materials as well? The HSTVL, being a test vehicle, had an all-aluminum turret, but their production vehicle would have had applique armor. It's worth noting that what drives the size of a tank is the engine. That's why the M60 and M1 series tanks are as large as they are. The waste heat of the diesel or turbine has to be displaced. We explored the use of an adiabatic engine made of ceramics, with no cooling system whatsoever. A production HSTVL type vehicle would have had that type of engine which, besides reducing the size slash weight of the vehicle even further, would have lowered the thermal signature of it. We tested a 400 horsepower adiabatic engine, which would have easily fit on a standard car table. Did the Autotrack system work well? The Autotrack system was very accurate. 
We tested it against helicopters and low-flying aircraft, think A-10 type of ground support, with great results. Of course, we just tracked the aircraft. We didn't fire any rounds at them. The HSTVO featured applique armor on its hull, and you mentioned it would have received this on the turret as well. What was the applique made of? I've seen mentions of it possibly being Kevlar, but in War Thunder it's RHA. The applique we looked at in model was, I believe, a sandwich of Kevlar and ceramic, because that had the best strength to weight ratio at the time of the study. I'm not sure why War Thunder would model as RHA. That would have added weight to what was supposed to be a lightweight, very mobile vehicle. Did you ever look into adding blow-up panels? We did not do any additional survivability studies, such as blow-up panels, because we were more interested in studying the force multiplier effect of a very mobile platform. We found that because of the speed and agility of the vehicle, the probability of the vehicle would be hit was significantly reduced. If the HSTVL had gone further, I'm sure it would have been a part of the development trade-off studies. Did you ever look into adding auxiliary weapons, like tow launchers, onto an HSTVL-type vehicle? We definitely looked at adding a tow to the HSTVL. However, that idea did not fare well for three reasons. 1. The slow rate of fire compared to the MCAAC. 2. The crewman in the turret had to expose himself to reload it. 3. The long time of flight to reach the target at range. Using a tow, the vehicle would not be able to move until the tow hit the target. That delay increased the probability the vehicle would be hit. What types of ammo were developed for the gun? The only types of rounds that we studied were the KE rounds and the high explosive proximity rounds. Those rounds served the purpose of being able to be used against hard and soft targets, as well as troops and helicopters slash aircraft. They also allowed an easier path to upgrade to the 90mm MCAAC. How did you determine how much penetration was required to kill T-80s? That's an interesting story. I believe that a similar methodology to what we use in the ACVT program is still used today. Obviously, if you have an actual T-80, you can just shoot it from different angles. If you don't have the vehicle, which we didn't, we use classified analysis from the CIA and DIA. Their analysis was done from high-altitude U-2 and SR-71 reconnaissance flights, from watching the tanks in Soviet parades, etc. From that analysis, you can extrapolate the weight of the vehicle. You then assume that the heaviest armor is on the front, and then ascribe an RHA equivalent value to the vehicle. We then had the ballistics research lab make slabs of RHA at the computed thickness, and shot the round at the slab mounted at various angles and ranges. Tables are then developed that describe the penetration at various ranges. We use those tables in our simulations. Was the HSTVL fairly reliable? The HSTVL was very reliable for a vehicle with that much technology in it. The most unreliable part of the program was actually the instrumentation recording the testing. Sometimes tests would have to be run multiple times because of it. It was so cool to see how the round dispersion was measured. After the HSTVL fired a three-round burst at the target, a still video frame of the target was displayed on screen. A technician would place a video marker over each hole on the target, and the X and Y coordinates would be measured. After a series of three-round bursts were fired in a variety of stationary or moving scenarios, the results became the dataset for dispersion analysis. I assume that the 75mm was fairly accurate? In my research, it's my understanding that CTA guns typically experience barrel wear faster. But if I remember correctly, the HSTVL's fire control system had a feature that took that into account. You are correct on that last part. What also increased barrel life was firing a three-round burst. When you fire a three-round burst and then move to a new firing position, it gives the barrel a chance to cool, so there's less wear on it. And that wraps it up. I hope you guys found these answers as cool as I did. They provide a ton of insight into the program, and how the HSTVL performed. Anyway, I'll see you guys in the next video.